Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time. We bless your name for the Bible study tonight. We thank you, Lord, because you prepared a fresh table for us. Lord, we pray the spiritual provision you are granting to us today. Our hearts will receive everything by faith in Jesus' name. And the goodness in your word, the beauty of the word, and the goodness that you are prepared for everyone. Lord, we pray it will do good in every life in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures spiritually for every one of us that we may see and behold wondrous and wonderful things out of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're still in the study of um, First Thessalonians. You remember? We've been studying this wonderful epistle and it's a wonderful church. The church of the Thessalonians. And we find some good qualities in that church, which is a prayer, a desire, and also our kind of uh, provision that the Lord has made for us. Let's look at chapter 1. I'm looking at verse 3. It says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and of our Father. The apostle was praising the Lord for them because he remembered the hope and the faith and the love that they had. These people had come to hear the word of God, the gospel, and the hearing of the gospel had made an impact in their lives. They were born again. They were saved. They were turned around and their lives became totally different. Look at chapter 1. We're looking at verse 9. It says, For they themselves show forth what manner of entering in we add unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. These people had repented. They gave their lives to the Lord. A mighty change came upon them. And everybody around them could see, they could tell, that this great change wrought a transformation, wrought a turning around, and wrought such a change. These people were in Christ. All things were passed away. All things were become new. Not only that, they were not just quiet, timid, fearful, reserved believers. They were outgoing and they were outspoken. They were witnessing and telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8 of chapter 1. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith is to faith to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. They so witness and publicize and publish and proclaim and preach the word of God that everybody around knew that Jesus is Savior that they could not save themselves, that they needed to turn from their sins like those tyrants have done, and then repent and turn totally to the Lord and drop every item of idolatry, every item of occultism, every item of evil in their hands, and then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Not only that, they were now patiently waiting for the coming of the Lord because they knew that salvation does not just end here. Just because we are saved here on earth doesn't mean that everything ends here. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord. Chapter 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They knew there was judgment to come, wrath to come. And because of that, they were not waiting, knowing that they had been delivered from that kind of problem that is coming in the future. But you need to know something, that as God used Paul and Silas and Timothy to bring the gospel to that place, to the Thessalonians, persecution arose. The pressure was so much that they had to be driven away from that city. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, we're looking at it from verse 1. Now, 
when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks and a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. Look at the persecution in verse 5. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took on to them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. That's why they left Thessalonica. But then after they left, they were still concerned about those believers. Were they continuing or were they not continuing? What is serving the Lord? What is backsliding? What is stable in the Lord in their commitment, in their consecration, in their conversion? Was the fruit of salvation still in their lives? That's why they were concerned. And Paul the Apostle wanted to go there many times, but he was hindered. I'm looking at chapter 2, verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore? We would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And because of that hindrance, he was thinking about it. What shall we do? How do we check up on the lives of the people? How do we know what has been happening to them? That's why now you come to chapter 3. He sent Timothy unto them. He wanted to know through Timothy. What's happening to them? Because he couldn't go. He couldn't visit them. Because of that, he sent Timothy. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter has tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Paul the apostle was such a passionate evangelist and a passionate pastor, and a passionate teacher of the word, that it wasn't just about teach the word and then go away and then forget all about the congregation. He thought about them. He wanted to know, what's their stage? What's their stage? How are they responding to that word? How are they giving their lives and everything they've got to that word? That's why when he couldn't go, he sent Timothy unto them. And then Timothy came back and gave a good report concerning them and told Paul the apostle that they were still holding on to the faith. They were standing steadfast in the Lord, established in the faith that he is in the conversion experience that they had. Chapter 3, verse 6, But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring to greatly to see us, as we also to see you. He said, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. He said, we are comforted, we rejoice because that fruit of salvation, the fruit of repentance, is seen very clearly in you. And Timothy is full of joy, and we are full of joy. And when he gave us that report, we said, what a wonderful thing. They were continuing in the Lord. That connects us with what we have today. What do we have today? We're talking about passionate prayers for godliness in the church. After Timothy had given the report, Paul the apostle said, now, he needed to be praying for them. He had been praying for them, but now he wanted to continue the prayer. What was the basis of the prayer? How frequent was the prayer? What was the intensity of that prayer? We're looking at verse 10. It says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which was lacking, which is lacking in your faith. He said, I've got a report. Thank God you are saved. Thank God you are stable. Thank God you are still standing. But as I got the report from Timothy, there are things you still need to know. 
There are six you don't know. And he says, I'm now desirous to come over to you so that I can perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And he said, the prayer he was praying. He was praying night and day. When he said he was praying night and day, what was he praying about? Now, the prayers of those of these apostles in the Bible, they're very, very instructive, illuminating, because it shows us what we need to be praying for the church, for every member of the church. Look at this now. I'm reading from verse 11. Now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase. This is a prayer I was praying for them. And this is the prayer every pastor ought to be praying for their congregation. This is the prayer every parent ought to be praying for their children. And this is the prayer members of the church ought to be praying one for another. Verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. One to another, one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end for the purpose so that he, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Paul the Apostle prayed for those believers, for those converts night and day. Each leader to be praying for the converse, for the followers, night and day. Every mother, every father, pray for the children, night and day. And you pray for your friends, your Christian friends, night and day. You are praying for them, that they will increase in the love of God, in the manifestation of the love of God. They will, they will increase in the expression of the practical love of God in their lives. This prayer was not a cold prayer. And it wasn't a prayer that had no life, had no passion. He prayed fervently. He prayed with earnestness. He prayed without intermission. That's why he said, I'm praying for you, and it is night and day. And was praying on the subject that is very, very important. The subject of righteousness, the subject of holiness, and the subject of godliness. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 8 there. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 8. The importance of righteousness. The importance of godliness. The importance of holiness. You know, Paul the Apostle prayed for something essential. Something indispensable. Something very necessary. He wasn't praying for some things that were not necessary. Redundant things, unimportant things, unessential things. He prayed for something important indispensable, essential, something you cannot do without. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 8. For bodily exercise profited little, but godliness, that's what I was praying for. That's what you ought to be praying for. That's what I ought to be praying for. You're praying, you're preaching, you're encouraging the people, counseling them. This is the most important commodity you ought to have in your life. Godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. The reason he prayed for that is because this is what will get the people to heaven. Grace, yes. Then after grace, we have godliness. And after that godliness, that's what leads to glory. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Paul the apostle then was a wise apostle. He knew that righteousness is very important. Godliness is very important. He knew that holiness is very important. And he said, yes, I can pray for other things. I can pray for your material needs. I can pray for God to supply all your needs, family needs, domestic needs, educational needs, academic needs, all the other needs. But the most important that I need to concentrate on is godliness, number one, righteousness, number two, because except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. How you need to concentrate also on that important theme, that important virtue in your life, godliness, righteousness, 
and holiness. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading there from verse 14. Follow peace with all men. You know, that takes the grace of God. Follow peace with all men. It's very easy to follow peace with the people that love you, the people that appreciate you, the people that support you, the people that are helping you. But when it says with all men, or the people who are a little bit difficult sometimes, and the people that are hard to go along with, as much as it lies in you because of heaven and because of eternity, it says follow peace with all men and then holiness and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And because of the importance of those things, that's why Paul the Apostle concentrated on that. And he said, I'm praying every time. I'm praying without ceasing. I'm praying frequently. I'm praying night and day that such virtue will be in your life. I pray that our concentration will be upon that in Jesus' name. Church leaders are to keep on praying for their fellow ministers and for Christian workers and for all the members of the church until they follow after godliness consistently out of a pure heart. We're looking at the study today on passionate prayer for godliness in the church. We we'll divide the study to three parts. Number one, impressive progress in heavenly love and guidance. Impressive progress in heavenly love. And there's a difference between human love and heavenly love. Human love, and that's the normal love you see in the midst of people. Because we have, we're natural people, we love one another, we encourage one another. But as human, without being saved, mothers love their children. Without being saved, children love their parents. Without being saved, people love one another. Neighbors love one another. But the Lord is saying we need to go beyond that. Because just the natural love, the human love, that has no grace in it. That has no salvation in it. That has no righteousness in it. That cannot take us to heaven. But when we go beyond the human love and the grace of God comes into our lives and we have that heavenly love and then you begin, it commences and you continue in it and you make progress in it and then you are guided by the hand of the Lord so that you can increase in that day by day. That is what gets us into deeper, richer, higher relationship with the Lord. Point number two, inspired petition for hearts established in godliness. Inspired petition. All the prayers that Paul the Apostle prayed, they were inspired by the Spirit of the Lord. And when you pray, you ought to also pray that God will give you inspiration that the prayer you pray will be guided by the Spirit of the Lord praying in the Holy Ghost to establish yourself and establish all the people. Number three now, importunate prayer for holiness before God. Importunate prayer, that means prayer without ceasing. That means prayer without getting tired. That means prayer without fainting. That means prayer until that holiness of heart, holiness of life is established in you, in your character, in your, inter in your interaction with other people. Importunate, very serious, day and night, until that holiness is established in you. We're looking at number one, impressive progress in heavenly love and guidance. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. It says, And the Lord make you to increase and to abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Uh, Paul the Apostle said, He was the Lord. To increase them, understand that this is not something you produce by human effort, that you produce by yourself. Some people, they try to love the believers, love their friends, and love their neighbors, love their enemies. When they find it hard, then they say, I cannot go further. I tried my best. That's your best. Get into Christ. And put on Christ. And let the grace of God increase and overflow in your life. And then pray that the Lord himself will make you to have, to possess, and to increase. And also to abound in that love one toward another. When you are taught of God and you are led of God, inspired by God, directed by God, controlled by God, helped by God, it will be easy. Because 
Love is the nature of God. And when you pray unto him, he, he plants that in your heart. And he puts that very nature of love in you. He teaches us how to love, how much to love, and when to do that. So he tells us in chapter 4, verse 9. Chapter 4, verse 9. And as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God. God to love one another. That God himself teaches his own children like parents teach their children. Like teachers teach their students. Like masters teach their disciples that the Lord Jesus himself and God himself teaches the believers, the children of God and God says this is my nature this is what I do. I'm good to the just and to the unjust. I'm kind to the just and to the unjust. I provide for the believers and the unbelievers. I love them in practical ways. I love them so that they will not suffer in life or suffer in eternity. And I'm passing that same nature unto you. He teaches us. And when we abide by his teaching, when we give in to his teaching, when we submit to his teaching, and when we experience the value of his teaching in our lives, then you find that that love manifests and it's expressed through you. Look at verse 10. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, we're pleading with you and teaching and encouraging you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. He's saying, don't say I've got enough, I've done enough. Do more. Go the extra mile. And do more. And love more. Because that is what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to just stay at what we got yesterday. What we got last week. What we did the other time. He wants us to increase in that love. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you always, always for you. What a church that was. Every remembrance of the Thessalonian believers just brought joy, gladness, fulfillment, accomplishment in the heart of Paul the Apostle. And he said, you know, you're very different from the church of Galatia. That, you know, Paul the Apostle said, I'm concerned about you. I'm worried about you. It's like I'm traveling in birds for you once again because I stand in doubt of you. But concerning the testimony believers, there's no doubt in the heart of Paul the Apostle. They were saved. They were separated from the world. And they were steadfast in the Lord. And every time he spoke to them, every time he remembered them, he said, I'm just so grateful to God that God directed me to you and that I ministered unto you. That's why how converse should bring a joy to the hearts of their soul winners. The people have brought them to the Lord. And if you're a soul winner, you know the joy you have when you find a believer that you have led to the Lord and they're praying, they're reading their Bible, they're making restitution, and they're living the Christian life. And the old things they were doing before, they have already abandoned. Every time you visit them, what joy you have. You will forget all the problems you are personally because of the joy that you have on those converts and what, that's what leaders have to you when a leader sees the people that he teaches and the people that he is mentoring and the people that he is shepherding and those members of the church they are following after the Lord, they love one another, there is no conflict or no battle among them and they are listening to the word of God and they are interested in carrying out, obeying that word of God, what joy it brings in the heart of their pastor and of their leader. That's why Paul the Apostle said, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity, the love of every one of you, all, every one of you, all toward each other aboundeth. And that is the kind of joy we ought to have towards you. I pray you'll be a child that brings joy members that bring joy to the leadership of the church when we see that salvation that that salvation you have it and then you're leaving it out and then the joy of the people of God will make us to want to do more sacrifice more so that you can be all you ought to be we're looking at John chapter 13 John chapter 13 we're reading from verse 34 the kind of love the Lord wants us to have one to another the, thought, the love that is thoughtful, the love that is thinking of other people, wanting other people to be happy, to be joyful, to be fulfilled, 
wanting other people to feel and to know that the labor is not in vain. In John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. The Lord is saying in every situation, in every condition, here is the commandment he has given to the people that belong unto him. To his own disciples said, a new commandment I give unto you. And the implication is, don't go back to the old covenant. So and so did such and such to such people. Don't go back to the old covenant. So and so destroyed that other village or that other city. Don't go back to that. Jesus said, look at me. I'm your perfect example. I am your savior. And because I'm your savior, I set the pattern for you that you should follow after my example. And this is what I've given to you. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of the world into the, unto the Father, and having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto when? Unto the very end. He was, you know, kind of suffering persecution, but he kept on loving them. He was going to the cross. He kept on loving them. And the pain of crucifixion was approaching. He kept on loving them. He prayed in Gethsemane and was sweating drops of blood. All the same, he loved the people unto the end. And the Lord is saying, the same love I want you to manifest. I want you to demonstrate that whatever you are going through personally in your life, whatever you are going through in your family, whatever you are going through in your place of work, whatever you are going through in your experience, remember that Jesus Christ has left that example. And if you are a real child of God, the Spirit of God is teaching you. And God the Father himself is teaching you. And what he teaches you, he'll never teach you to hate anybody. He'll never teach you to do evil, to hurt anybody. The only teaching the Lord can give us, the Lord can give you, is that you love one another, even as I have loved you. That means then, if you don't love, that action of lack of love is not from God. It's not God teaching you that. And whatever God is not teaching you, if you're doing that, that means that there'll be no reward for you in eternity. But it says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By they shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If, if what? If you love, or if you have love one for another. That means then, that's what the Lord wants us to practice. He wants us to manifest the grace, the conversion, the salvation that results in love one toward another. That's the kind of love that affects your mind, affects your thoughts, affects your heart, affects your action, affects your habit, affects your interaction. Everything that you do to other people were taught by God to love one another. Every moment, by the way. It's not just love a moment of time and then the next moment there's hatred or there's animosity and conflict but everyone every time if you're a real child of God you're a child of God every time whenever you know there's problem you're still a child of God aren't you and whenever you're having your own challenges and trials and troubles you're still a child of God and as long as you remain a child of God whatever you're going through he wants us to manifest that love one toward another in Galatians chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 6 Galatians chapter 5 Verse 6, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. You know what he's saying? The religion of the Jewish people centered on circumcision. Have you been circumcised? If you are not circumcised, they think, they think of you like a gentle, as if you are like a nobody. It was the most important thing to them. It was the very height of their religion, the Pharisees. But the Lord, the Lord is saying, in Christ Jesus, religion is nothing. All those activities, nothing. Circumcision or baptism or whatever, nothing. But then it says, but faith that walketh by love. Faith that walketh by love. It tells us in verse 13 of that same chapter, verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You know, there are some people that always, they always say, concentrate on, this is my right. 
have the liberty to do whatever I want to do. But don't forget love. It's like a man swinging his hand and was saying, hey, mind what you are doing. Say, don't, don't bother me. I have the liberty to swing my hand. Yes, of course, you have the liberty to swing your hand, except when your neighbor is very near and the swinging of your hand will hurt your neighbor. Your liberty, your freedom ends at the point when your neighbor might suffer from that liberty and from that freedom. That's why he's saying, oh yes, we're free. In verse 13, for brethren, we have been called unto liberty, unto freedom. We can do whatever it is we want to do as long as we are acting in love. By love serve one another. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It says, if we have the Spirit within us, the evidence of that, the fruit of that will be love. What, what if we don't have love? Then we don't have the fruit of the Spirit. If we don't have the fruit of the Spirit, what's the implication? We don't have the Spirit of God. Because anywhere the Spirit of God is, His fruit will be there. If the Spirit of God is not there in our hearts, it says, He that does not have the Spirit of Christ is none of His. He might be a churchgoer, a Bible reader, a religious fellow, he professes that he raised up his Sunday crusade. He said he's born again. He makes a lot, a loud noise as to his profession. I am this, I am that. If you don't have the spirit of God, you are not of Christ. And if you have the spirit of God, the fruit will be there. For the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. After you are born again, the flesh will try to raise up its ugly head. You know, the flesh might come, come out with anger or with conflict or with, you know, kind of hurting, irritating other people and hurting other people. That's the flesh. When it wants to get up, it says, they that are Christ, they have the grace, they have the power to crucify the flesh with the affections and the loss thereof. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let what you have satisfy you and please you and do not hurt other people. This new birth results in the love of God in our heart. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 verse 22 verse 23. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. That's the evidence of being born again. That you purify your heart, your soul, your inner man in obeying the word of the Lord. And, and you ask yourself, as you live this whole day, what, what commandment of God have you obeyed today? What check of the spirit have you listened to today? You know, there are people that live their lives and they, nev they never obey the word of God. The Lord is telling them something in their hearts. Are you born again? Be a new creature. Are you a child of God? Demonstrate a new creature. Are you actually following the Lord, having the hope of heaven? Demonstrate that you are saved. Let the difference between the world and you be very clear. But if you don't obey that voice of the Spirit, you are telling people around you, you are just like them, and you don't have the salvation of the Lord. But it says that seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. Unfeigned love, what does, that, what does that mean? Unpretended love. Something that is not hypocritical. Sincere love. Genuine love. The love of Christ from the heart. The love of the brethren. See that she love one another with what kind of heart? A pure heart. Not lost. I love you. I love you. I love you. And then they are thinking of the flesh. I love you. They're thinking of immorality. I love you. They're thinking of wanting to do evil. I love you. They're thinking of going behind closed doors and messing up themselves. Not, not that kind of love. That one is lost. That one is sin. But it says the kind of love that's out of a pure heart and you love one another fervently. In verse 23, being born again. He said, after all, you are born again. If you are born again, here is the evidence you are going to have. You are going to have the demonstration of that love. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, 
but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I pray that this same love that the Thessalonians uh, demonstrated, that we will demonstrate it in Jesus' name. You know, we know the presence of love by the absence of something. And in the presence of other qualities in our lives. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm reading there from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It says, where there is love, there will be the absence of bitterness. When bitterness is absent, love is present. There will be the absence of wrath. When wrath is absent, that then it means love is present. There will be the absence of anger. You, don't, you are not angry at somebody you love. Even when they do things you didn't expect. Even when they do things and are mistakenly or foolishly. You love them so much. It's like a mother loving her baby. And the baby might kick and cry and scream or whatever. You know, there's, there's no anger in the heart of the mother just because that child is kind of exercising a voice. Or maybe you are a man and a woman. I, then you are in courtship together. And, you know, you love the woman so much. Whatever she does, you know, some things. I don't know that she could do something like this, but you love. And because of, there's no anger. There will be the absence of anger when there is the presence of love. And then clamor, that's shouting on people, bullying on people, and driving them with a kind of angry tone and angry voice. That will not be there. Or evil speaking, gossiping, backbiting. You don't backbite and speak evil of the people you really love. All that will be absent. And malice, malice will be absent when there is love. And then in verse 32, we now see what is present when there is love. And be kind one to another. There will be kindness when you love. You will be very thoughtful of your brother, of your sister, of your neighbor, of your wife, of your husband, of your children, of your parents. You'll be very, very thoughtful of the fellow member in the church when there is love. And then you'll be kind towards them, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's the kind of love Paul the apostle was encouraging the Thessalonians. He said, I'm impressed about you. I appreciate you so much because you are abounding and increasing in the love of God. We come to number two now. Inspired petition for hearts established in godliness. Inspired petition. Petition means a plea. Petitions means, petition means a prayer that was inspired by the Lord to pray for these Thessalonian believers. And as he prayed for them, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for us. The Holy Spirit is making intercession for us. And our leaders are praying for us too. And if there's anything that the leaders ought to intensify their prayers about, it is so that this thing that we're reading about here will be in our lives as well. Look at verse 13 of chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 13, verse 3. It says, The reason for my prayer the purpose of my prayer, the end of my prayer, the pursuit of my prayer. It says to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable before God. Paul the apostle said, I'm not going to stop praying for you until I see that your hearts are established unblameable in holiness before God. And there are some people that have a passing experience of holiness for a particular day, one single day. They say, oh, praise the Lord today. It's been wonderful. No temptation. Praise the Lord today. No falling. No yielding unto anything that is uh, of the flesh, that is corrupt. Praise the Lord today. Today has been wonderful. Well, we thank God today. Why don't you then think the grace that kept you in holiness today can keep you in holiness tomorrow? And the grace that does that for two days can do that for three days, can do that for one week. And the grace of God that keeps you in holiness and righteousness without sinning without going into evil, without going back to your old bad habits. The grace that kept you for one week can keep you for one month, and the grace that keeps you for one month can keep you for, tell me the rest, for one year, and if he keeps you for one year, he can keep you for the rest of your life. That's why Paul the Apostle was praying. He said, what I want to see is not a temporary experience of holiness, 
What I want to see is a continual, continuing experience of holiness in your life. And he prayed passionately for them that they'll be unbelievable in holiness before God, even before our, Lord, before the, our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This means establishing holiness. And that's a beautiful thing. You're not just up and down today on the mountain, tomorrow in the valley. Today, you're so loving, you're so beautiful in your character, and then tomorrow, you're all ugly and angry and fighting up and down, to and fro. It says, be settled, be established in that life and character of godliness, righteousness, and holiness. The grace of God will do it in your life. I thought you'll say, Amen. Amen. But looking at Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, we're looking at verse 8 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, verse 9, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. It says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is steady, he is stable, he is, he is established, he remains the same yesterday, today and forever. And if you are a child of God, the same way that Jesus Christ is stable and solid and steady and established, the same way you ought to be steady, the same way you ought to be established and the same way you ought to be remain in the will and the word of God. Verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Wonderful. That your heart be established with grace. Not that, you know, when you're happy, you're righteous, you're, you know, you obey the Lord. Because you're happy, God has just done this for you. There's a miracle of healing, a miracle of provision, a miracle of marriage, a miracle of this, a miracle of that. And because of that now, you're all righteous. I'm going to serve the Lord. You promise the Lord heaven and earth. And then when a little temptation comes, a little need comes to your life, a little lack in your life, and then you go back and slow down and say, I don't know whether I want to love the Lord again like I promised I wanted to. Be stable and be steadfast and tell them come what may rain or sunshine I'm going to be established in righteousness with the grace of God not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein we're looking at Psalm 112 Psalm 1 1 2 established in godliness established in righteousness established in holiness established in the experience of sanctification we're looking at Psalm 112 I'm reading there from verse 7 and verse 8 it says he shall not be afraid of evil tidings you better understand that in this world there's what is, what is called evil tidings you know you'll hear some stories about yourself you say that's unbelievable who are they talking about because there are some people that all they just want to do is to frustrate your life and they may tell lies against you but it says you'll not be afraid you're not going to change the way you're living you're not going to change your conviction just because of those evil tidings you shall not be afraid of evil tidings his heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. Say, my heart is fixed. Say that again, my heart is fixed. Say that for the final time. That means that as you know, you became converted and then unbelievers, maybe your old friends, they're saying, how is it you went to born again church? How is it you went to holy, holy church? How is it you went to deeper, deeper church? Well, you say, my heart is fixed. I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. Whatever they say and whatever they do, you know, have you read in the, you know, the back of some of those uh, lorries that they are passing by? It says, let them say. So you, whatever your, you know, your old friends or whatever they are, whatever they say, you say, let them say, my heart is fixed. Then it says in verse 8, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. We're looking at Psalm, Psalm 57. Psalm 57, the psalmist is telling us over and over about the condition of his heart. He knew that, you know, there will be people that will try to jolt you and push you and distract your attention and make you not to stay on your conversion, on your commitment, on your consecration. But the psalmist said, it doesn't matter what they do, it doesn't matter what they say. I'm, I've decided to follow the Lord. No turning back, no turning back. You will not turn back in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 57 verse 7. My heart is fixed to God. My heart 
his fees. Can you read that with me? Won't you go? Finish it up. I will sing and give glory. You know, there are some people, they can sing during the day, but when a little problem comes, they say, I don't have any song. It's only crying and weeping and mourning. And then they say, oh, I didn't know sometimes on the mountains, sometimes in the valley, it's not an easy road. They begin to cry, wipe off away the tears. Be a man, be a woman, and be a real believer, and be a champion. You'll be a champion. Over all your problems and over all those heartaches, you'll say, my heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give glory. I'm looking at Psalm 108. Psalm 108 verse 1. Telling us the same thing. It just tells you about this psalmist. His heart was established. And he said, there is nothing else for me to do for the rest of my life. My heart is fixed in serving the Lord. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. The Lord is calling us to steadfastness. He doesn't want us to waver or to shake or to tremble or to be looking here and there. If you are born again, remain steady. If you are committed to the Lord, consecrated to the Lord, remain steady. And if you have promised the Lord your life and you say, Lord, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life, whatever unbelievers do or say, here is my decision. My heart is fixed to God. My heart is fixed. I'm reading to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading there from verse 16. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're reading there from verse 16 and verse 17 it says now the lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means always by all means always by all means uh, you know when your heart is peaceful in the lord and you know that always whatever persecution or pain or problem challenges Conflict, you just say, My heart is fixed because the God of peace is granting me the peace in my heart, the peace that is deeper than any sea, any ocean. And He does that always, by all means, at all times. The Lord be with you all. The Lord be with you all. Let's look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, I'm reading there from verse 8. James 5, verse 8. It says, be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Establish your heart. Be stable because the coming of the Lord is very near. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Uh, just understand every time that the Lord is watching your heart. Is watching your attitude. He's taking note of how you are responding to life and the things that you're doing. And then you're telling the Lord, oh Lord, I'm going to remain. I'm going to remain steadfast in the Lord. And no matter what is happening, the wind that might blow around me or the voices that might hear behind me, I'm going to remain established in godliness. Uh, Paul the Apostle actually planned to go to Thessalonica. And he wanted to go there for the purpose of establishing the brethren in their faith, establishing them in the truth, and establishing them in godliness. And for those of us leaders who travel around, pastors who travel around, evangelists who travel around, or teachers of the word that travel around, when we travel around, it's not just to see people's faces. It's not just, oh, pastor came, the GS came, our, our overseer came, region overseer, state overseer, national overseer. He came to visit us and then to be like a sugar daddy. How are you there? Wonderful. Shake their hands or, you know, whatever. And then bye-bye. I just came to greet you. No, you are there to establish them in the faith. Establish them in the truth. Establish them in godliness. Paul the apostle said, I'm coming to you. I'm planning to come to you so that I can perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You look at their faith for salvation. You want to perfect that so that there will be serious real assurance in them. And there will be nothing like shaking, doubting whether they are saved or they are not saved. Or about their sanctification. To establish them in the faith for sanctification. Or the baptism, the power in the Holy Ghost for service. To establish 
establish them and to perfect that which is lacking in them. Paul the apostle always preached and taught and prayed to the end for the purpose he may establish their hearts unblameable in holiness before God. And that's what we what were to do. We were preachers. We were pastors. And we were leaders in the church of the living God. That this important experience of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Anywhere we go, any congregation we go to, you want to establish them unblameable in holiness. How we live with our neighbors, how we live in our communities, how we live in the church, that the church members will be totally different from the people of the world. Godliness, a heavenly virtue that comes from God. Only God can impart each to our our hearts because it is his nature. By grace he forgives all our sins. By grace he cleanses our hearts from all sin. By grace he lights up the lamp of grace in our hearts. And we cannot produce acceptable godliness in our human strength. Don't let us just say I will try more. It's not trying. I'll turn over a new leaf. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's by the grace of God that he himself, he does that work of grace in your heart in your life. A man has no more power to change himself than he has power to create himself. Godliness is from above and only God can produce it in us in answer to the prayer of faith. Godliness affects man in his heart. Godliness affects man in his life. In the healing part of that, of that man's heart and in every part of his life, God effects that grace and that reality of holiness, righteousness, and godliness. You know, it's not enough to just say, this area of my life is righteous. That area of my life is righteous. How about all the other parts? You check up every part. Your mind, your thoughts, your heart, your soul, your disposition, your language, your action, your interaction, everything that you do. And the grace of God is able to do it. I said the grace of God is able to do it. He whose, whose heart is filled with holy affection. Those are the people that we say are holy because your affection, your love, your thoughts toward men and women, no matter where you are, in private and in public, you have that holy affection. Not only number two, the people whose will is submissive unto God in obedience. That's what you call holiness when you say, not my will, but your will. Only the will of the Lord. Not what your flesh wants you to do. Not what your mind is pushing you to do. But you are totally submissive to the will of God in obedience. Number three, those people whose ways are guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Those are the people who say are holy. That your way, the direction in which you are living, the decisions you are making, those decisions, they are not based on the, what your friends like. Not all your friends are prayerful. Not all your friends are scriptural. And not all your friends are dependable. It's not what your friends want. It's the will of the Lord, the direction in which you go, the way in which you are walking. And the people whose ways are just according to the word of the Lord and according to the will of the Lord, directed and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Those are the people who say are godly. Number four, the people whose tongues are held by his holy bridle. Those are the people who say are godly men, but the people just talk, talk, talk. And the people, they talk about what they know, they talk about what they don't know. They talk about what's in the dark and what's in the open. They talk about something up there and something down below there. They just talk. And they talk without verifying what they are saying. Those are not holy people. Those are not committed Christians. But the people that choose their tongue in such a way that they have a holy bridle. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. If anybody says, I'm a member of the church. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm sanctified. I'm this. I'm that. But he bridles not his tongue. It says, but he deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. That man's religion, the one who cannot control his tongue, cannot bridle his tongue, and talks about almost every subject on the face of the earth without having assurance of what he's saying. That's not a real committed Christian. Chapter 3 of James, verse 1. My brethren, be not many talkers, be not many masters, be not many teachers, 
be not many informants. You know, there are people, they just, they're talking and talking. You always have information. Where did you get all this information? Well, that's me. Well, that means that that me is not a Christian. It says, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The people that talk and talk and talk without end, without verifying what they say. It says they receive greater condemnation, for in many things to offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. The one that's not able to control the tongue, the tongue that will see, he'll not be able to control the other parts of the body that we don't see. If you're not able to control the external, you'll not be able to control the internal. And your tongue will give you away. If you're a talkative, you'll be a sinner. Because in much talking, there is sin. It says in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hem. Whithersoever the governor listeth, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. And it says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. That's the reason why if you're a real, real child of God, the Holy Spirit is controlling your tongue, puts a bridle on your tongue. Number five, the people that will say are godly according to Bible description. They are people whose devotion is focused on honoring and glorifying God. It says, all I want to do is to honor God. Anywhere I go, anything I say, anything I do, any place I am, I want to honor and glorify God. Number six, the people whose temper is influenced by the holy word of God and by the power of God. They don't have this boisterous temper, angry temper, violent temper that you know, almost wants to kill and hurt and destroy whenever something comes upon them. And then when the fire is come down, then they call down and say, oh, I'm sorry. Any, any time that that thing comes upon me, that's, you know, I act that way. I even thank God there wasn't a cutlass around. You only a stick. Uh, you should be praising your God that it was only a stick around when I got angry. That's not a Christian. Is that a Christian? You'll be able to control your temper. To be under the control of the Spirit of God. You know, be shaking and shivering with anger. You be a real child of God, and then your word, your action, your life will be controlled, directed by the peaceful Spirit of God. The godly person is one who has become a partaker of the divine nature. That's the godly man. God, by grace, can make you, can make me, can make each of us godly. We're going to be godly in Jesus' name. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. I'm reading from verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us, he has given it already. His grace is available. His love is abundant. And it says, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. He gives us that nature, the divine nature. That is the nature of God himself. And his nature is holy. His nature is a sanctified nature, a pure nature. It says we're given, he has given us great precious promises that by these we might partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through loss. We come to point number three now. Importunate prayer for holiness before God. Importunate prayer for holiness before God. And this is something we need to pray for. As we look at Christians all over this country, our country here, all over this continent of Africa, many Africans are, are reputable as people that pray. 
And anywhere you go, they say, oh, Africans, they know how to pray, they know how to pray. But what do Africans pray about? What do Nigerians pray about? What do church members and church goers pray about? All these posters we see outside come for a night of prayer and come for, you know, a period of prayer. They're going to do this. They're going to prayer, prayer, prayer. What are they praying about? Not holiness. Check up. Check up on them. There will be no mention of holiness, sanctification, godliness, righteousness. All they are praying about, there are things that perish of the world. I pray you will not be like that. I said you will not be like that. And think about pastors pray, evangelists pray, prayer warriors pray. And think of what those pastors are praying about most of the time. Not holiness. Not the holiness of the members of the church. Not godliness of the members of the church. Not sanctification for members of the church. They are praying for some other things. You know what they are praying about. All the people that are coming to the pastor, coming to the evangelist, coming to the leaders, coming to the prayer world, pray for us, pray for us. They are not praying on this important thing. But the Lord is saying, be wise. The Lord is saying, look at the scriptures again. The Lord is saying, look at what the Lord is telling us and what the Lord is implying when he teaches us the word. And he says, this is the important commodity, important virtue, the thing that will take you to heaven, that we need to pray about. I'm coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. We might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. And that's the thing we're praying about. Then it goes on now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, that is so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He wants everybody to become saintly. That's why he's praying for that. And let's look at what the word of God is saying on this important virtue, important experience, important lifestyle of holiness. That as you look at your life and you say, Lord, I want more. I need more. Or have we got enough? I said, have we got enough? No, we want more. We need more. You know, you drank water yesterday. You need more water today. And you had some food yesterday. You need some food today too. You wore clothes yesterday. You still need some clothes today. And we had holiness yesterday and last week and last year. Thank God for those who have holiness. Thank God for those who are sanctified. We need more. That's the reason why the apostle was praying for them. Already he said, I'm thanking God for you because of your labor of love and your patience of hope and then your work of faith. He already needs you. They had a good experience of righteousness and godliness, but he said, I'm praying that you'll be established in it. You'll be deep in it. You'll dwell in it. It will increase in your life. That's why we too were praying that thank God for what he has done for us. Thank God for the assurance of salvation and thank God for the level of holiness we have already. But he says, we need to do more, have more, experience more. Luke chapter 1 verse 74 verse 75. Luke chapter 1 verse 74 that he would grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him how long? All the days of our lives. You know, there are some people that will say, well, holiness, eh, that was good in the 70s when deeper life started. Holiness, that was all right in the 80s when deeper life was still growing. But now you know at this time now, as we look at, you know, we're getting married and we need children and we have children, we want to educate them. We have family, we want jobs and we have this, we have this. At this, this is not the time you're talking about holiness. 1970 something, holiness, that was all right. But now for them, they think the age of holiness is over. Is it over? No, it says holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, here is what the Lord is telling us, reminding us of. Romans chapter 6, I'm reading there from verse 19. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. 
For as ye have yielded your members, servants unto uncleanness, and iniquity to iniquity, that's in the past when you were sinners, it says, even now yield your members, servants unto righteousness, and unto holiness. That's why Paul the Apostle made it a duty, praying for them to have this holiness more and more, over and over, abundantly in their hearts and their lives all the time. And let's look at verse, let's look at verse 22. But now, be made, be made free from sin, and become, and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. It says before we can have that everlasting life, there must be holiness. That's why I said I'm praying for you to the end. Ye might be established in holiness before God all at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises daily beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. I thought we are cleansed already. I thought he has converted us and washed us in the precious blood of the Lamb. Why is it saying again that let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit? You know what? You wash you washed yesterday and the day before. When you woke up this morning, you had to wash again. Why? Because you need that washing and that cleansing every day. You know, sometimes if you are washing in a bath, you, when you wash and you clean yourself with the soap, you are surprised about the dirty water you see on the ground. You say, where did this come from? Even though I washed yesterday, I washed the other day. Today, as you are washing again, you see the dirty water. That's telling you that you need that cleansing every day. As we mix with the people of the world, interact to the people of the world, go to the office, the things they say, the things they show, the things they see, the people that are near us, and the things our ears are hearing, they have the tendency of corrupting our hearts and polluting our hearts. That's why we go into the blood of the Lamb every time. And then he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then he says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I pray it will happen in our lives. Let's do that just like you wash your mouth every day and you wash your body every day and you wear clean clothes every day. You go to the Lord every day. Oh Lord, more righteousness, more holiness, uh, more stability in the Lord, in the grace of God. And day by day, as you do that gracefully and you do that uh, regularly, you'll find that you'll be acceptable in the sight of the Lord in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. It says, and that you put on the new man. Put on the new man. Just like you put on your clothes, put on your shoes, put on the new man. You do that every time. Every time. You wake up in the morning, you have a good bath and then you put on new good clothes, clean clothes. Put on the new man which after God is created after righteousness and true holiness. And it says when that is there, see what will happen in verse, 20, in verse 25 wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. When you put on Christ, you're not going to tell lies. When you put on the new man, you're not going to tell lies. When you put on the new nature, you wake up in the morning, you say, Lord, as I read my Bible, as I read the word of God now, I want, as I'm going out, I want to put on the new man, the righteousness and the holiness and the new life and the beautiful life. And then it says, you're not going to be a liar. You'll not lie in action. You'll not lie in words. It says, wherefore putting away lying, speak every every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another in verse 26 be angry and sin not it's a commandment be angry and sin not it's not saying if you are angry don't sin no it's saying be angry and sin not what does that mean when somebody wants to bring temptation to you don't smile from your face and say what what are you doing why do you want to do that why don't you lead me into sin? I'm a child of God. I don't do something like that. That's what it means. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the angry get in, anger get into bitterness, get into clamor, get into exchanging blows. No, just frown at sin. Hate sin. Don't hate the sinner. Be angry and sin not. And then it says, let not 
the sun go down upon your rose. You're angry because she, he wanted to do evil. Now he has a need. Don't say he wanted to do that the other time. Therefore, I'm not going to help him. Don't let the sun go down upon your rose. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. The devil will try to get that life from you, eternal life from you. He come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But you say, Jesus said, I've come so that you have life and have it in abundance. Don't give place or chance or liberty to the devil. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. That's the holiness. That's the holiness. It's not just, you know, the wearing of scarf and the wearing of long dress. All that is good. Put on your scarf when you want to. But I'm saying that holiness does not terminate. Just in your dressing, it says over here, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor walking with his sons. The sin which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's holiness. That corrupt communication, dirty word, dirty word, will not come out of your mouth. You know, sometimes you find some people, I think uh, they are ignorant. They may be believers, but they are ignorant. They say they are giving testimony. And then in their testimony, they'll begin to mention some sensitive parts of the body. That's uncivilized kind of conversation, testimony. That they say uh, this, this, and this, and then they mention it shocks you that a lady can be, you know, giving testimony and mention something like that that talks about different parts of the body. Or it's a man that is giving testimony and then he's talking some things and say, how could he say that? Corrupt communication. If we're children of God, if we have the holiness of God, the language we use in public when men are there, women are there. There will be things that are clean and pure and righteous and holy. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, which whereby were sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, how many, how much of bitterness? all. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And that's the way the Lord wants us to live. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading there from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands what are we to do? Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Let us see that holiness at home. Let's see the love at home. Let's see the fruit of what we're learning at the Bible study. Let's see it between husband and wife, between wife and husband, between parents and children, between children and parents, between the teachers and the students in the school, and between the neighbors, members to one another. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it unto himself, a glorious church. Will be a glorious church. I said our church will be a glorious church. You know what you, should be, what you should be thinking about? You should be thinking, as I become a member of this church, the church was glorious before I came. My presence in this church will make the church more glorious. Give me an amen to that. As fellowship was glorious before you got there, my presence in this house fellowship will make the house fellowship more glorious. All our sections in the various in the church, this section, that section, that section, they were wonderful and holy and righteous and loving and dutiful and obedient, faithful, loyal. Before you came, you pray that your presence in that section of the work of the church will make the church and that section more glorious because that's the purpose of the Lord. That's why you are there. It says that he may present he to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You will be holy. You will be without blemish. And the Lord who has called us is faithful, is able to do it. I said he's able to do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we know you are able. Able to save, able to sanctify, able to cleanse, able to purge, able to purify, able to make us righteous, able to make us holy. The Lord can do it. He will do it. 
You need to be holy. I need to be holy. We need to be holy together. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. You remember, holiness is very important, very essential. It's something we cannot do without. Whatever else we have, if we don't have holiness, we don't have anything. Whatever else we possess, if we don't possess holiness, we don't possess anything. Heaven will elude us. We'll miss heaven if we don't have this important virtue in our lives. It's available for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood so that he'll make you glorious. He'll make you righteous. He'll make you godly. He'll make you holy without spot, without wrinkle, or any blemish in your life at all. Able to make us unblameable in holiness. You tell the Lord, examine your life. Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you a real child of God? The church is a glorious church. Glorious and beautiful. Let your presence and your being part of the church increase our godliness, increase the glory, and increase the beauty of the church. God is a merciful God, a loving God, kind, loving, good, gracious, he has called us by his grace. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us, to shed his blood for us. And since that's what he has done, and he's calling you, he said, come, I'll cleanse you. Come, I'll purge you. Come, I'll purify you. Come, I'll make you holy. Just call upon the name of the Lord. Wash in the blood of the Lamb. Be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. And say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Cleanse me, Lord. The words of your mouth, the thoughts of your heart, the leaning of your life, the direction of your life, your interaction, your fellowship with people around you that are saying, Oh, Lord, here am I. Oh, Lord, here am I. Your church is glorious. I want my place in the church to make your church more glorious. Your church is beautiful. And I want my membership in the church, my place in the church, to make your church more beautiful. The church is without spot, without blemish. The fact that I'm a part of the church, or my interaction, my contribution, my presence in the church to make your church more gracious, more beautiful, more pleasing unto God. It says you cleanse yourself from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting Perfecting, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He can do it. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Remember, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, just external righteousness, only in the address. Only in what they wore, only in what they put on. But you want something internal, experiential. And the Lord is able, able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all, we ask or think according to the power. The power of the Spirit that walketh in us. He'll do it. Yes, He will. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, seas of the flesh, from all sin. Sins of the spirit from all sin is able. 
It will transform the heart. Transfigure your life. Make you a glorious part of a glorious church. Pray that your love will increase more and more. Genuine love. Pure love. Transparent love. Towards the brethren. Men towards women. Pure love. Women towards men. Pure love. Thank God for the love you have. The apostle is praying for us. That that love will increase and abound. And I want you to pray that that genuine, spiritual, Christ like kind of love with goodness and kindness, that that will increase. The love today more than you loved yesterday, more thoughtful more kind more compassionate more helpful more thoughtful pray that that love will increase more and more and pray that you'll be established in holiness and righteousness not going up and down, deep today and shallow tomorrow. No. Shining more and more onto the perfect day. Going deeper and deeper, higher and higher in the love of God, in the life of righteousness and holiness. Our God is able, able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Is anything too hard for me to do? God said. That nature, it can change that nature. Anything too hard for God? He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He created us by his mighty power. He can recreate us. Give the newest kind of nature in our heart, in our life, and our will, and make us through and through. A real child of God, real man of God, real woman of God. That's what he does to prepare us for heaven. That's what he does to prepare us for the rapture. Tell the Lord, do it in me. No anger, no conflict. No clamor, no shouting on other people, no envy, no jealousy, no wrath, no malice, no evil speaking. And pray that that such experience will be your normal experience. Not just something special one day and the rest of the week that we're going to live in the flesh. Pray that all your life, your character, the direction of your life, the decisions of your life, will be under their direction and control 
of the Spirit of the Lord. Our God is able, able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Pray that you will perfect whatever is lacking in your commitment. You will perfect whatever is lacking your spiritual experience that the Lord will not leave you alone until he gets you ready for the coming of the Lord. He will. He can. Great God. Wonderful God. Gracious God. He loves you so much. He doesn't want to leave you in such a state that is not perfect in his sight. Lord, perfect that which is lacking in my faith. Oh Lord, perfect that which is lacking in my experience. Lord, perfect that which is lacking in my holiness. Help me to live to the glory of your name, always laboring, always desiring to honor you, to glorify you. Whatever my situation, whatever the challenge, Help me to stand faithful unto you. To be holy and righteous before you all the days of my life.